choosing a mold material and calculating volume. These are probably two of the most asked questions that we get through our website and on our YouTube channel. So in this tutorial, we're going to cover the thought process of choosing a hard or a soft silicone for a particular pattern or mold process and also how to calculate volume. Now for this particular video, we'll just be covering the rectangular volume formula, but I'll link to a video at the end of this video uh, on cylindrical volume. So be sure to check that out as well. But to start with, soft silicones are usually best used for parts with uh, deep undercuts, like the skull mold we showed a few seconds ago. And firm silicones are better suited for multi-piece rubber molds that have to key together and hold their shape very well when they're strapped and put under tension when you're casting expanding foams or precision resin parts. So it's important to remember that there's not a perfect rubber product. There's not a perfect silicone. Different silicones are more appropriate for different applications. Soft silicones are best used for parts with deep undercuts, whereas firm silicones are best used for more angular parts, parts with minimal undercuts, and more importantly, multiple piece molds where interlocking sides of the mold have to come together and form a tight seam that doesn't distort when the mold is put together. Together. Now, for this video, we'll be molding a small rectangular tile. And typically, this is a part that could be molded with any of our silicones. But because this particular part I'm going to reproduce as a cold metal cast or do a cold cast brass piece out of this mold, I want something fairly soft because that really helps it grab the uh, metal powder when it's dusted across the surface of the mold, as you'll see later on. So just a quick recap about the Shore A scale. The Shore A scale ranges from human skin or around a Shore A10, so the lower number is softer and the higher numbers are harder materials. And then we go on up to about a 40, which would be about like a pencil eraser, a 60 to 70 would be about like a car tire, and then we have a 90, which would be about like a hard hat. Most of our mold materials are going to fall in the range of about a 10 to a Shore A50. But in this case, we'll be using the 5110. Now, just for the sake of convenience, most of our products that we sell, the last two digits of the product name are the Shore A value. So the 5110, for instance, is a Shore A10. And of course, 5130 is around a Shore A30. 5140 is about a 40. 5150 is about a 50. And it's important to know that that way, just at a glance, you can typically tell the softness of a given rubber material. Now for our mold on this rectangular tile, we're just going to make a simple foam core box like we've done in a lot of previous videos. But one of the things I want to bring up here is just that, that consideration of all the different elements of your pattern and your casting material. All of those factors go into choosing that mold material. And remember, there's a lot of exceptions to a lot of different rules. So in this case, even though we could use a firmer silicone, the casting material in this instance dictates that we use a softer material to help grab that metal powder. But uh, real important to remember that factors like the size of the pattern can also play into this. This is a small part and we can get away with a very soft mold. But remember, if we're doing a large rectangular pattern, that uh, it might be a good idea to go to a firmer rubber because larger patterns could get out, out of alignment when we're using something really soft like 5110. Now, once we've constructed our mold box, we're ready to calculate the volume. And we're going to do a very simple cubic inch volume calculation on this, and then I'll show you how to convert that into how many pounds or how many grams of silicone you need. Now, the volume formula for a rectangular box like this is very simple. Length times width times height. So our box is five and a quarter long by three and a half wide by one inch deep. So I'm not even going to multiply that one because we all know that's just going to give us the same thing. So 18.375 cubic inches is the volume of our mold box. Now in some cases when you have a larger pattern it makes sense to calculate the volume of the pattern and subtract that from the volume of the box. But this is a simple and small enough mold it doesn't make sense to do that. 
But now we need to figure out the cubic inches per pound of the silicone we'll be using. So for that, we're going to flip through our hymnal here to the mold making platinum silicones. And then we're going to look for the 5110 column. And there you see the number, the 25 cubic inches per pound is the density of 5110. It's also important to note that different silicones have different densities. So remember, each time you do this, if you're using a different silicone, you might have to do different math for that silicone and use that number accordingly. And of course, all of this volume calculation information is on page 45 of our latest product guide. So just FYI. Now that we know the cubic inches per pound, we divide our mold box volume by 25 and we wind up with 0.735. So roughly three quarters of a pound of silicone is what it will take to mold this rectangular tile. Now one additional step that I like to use because I like to convert everything to grams when possible is I go to the interwebs and find a conversion site and I convert those pounds to grams. And that just makes things so much easier to work in grams rather than pounds. And then once I have that number in grams, now you can take that, and since we're using a one-to-one -one mix ratio material, we can take that, and here we have 334 grams. We divide that by two, and we wind up with 167 grams of each component. So that makes our work a lot easier. So now we know exactly what we need of parts A and B to make our silicone mold. Now before we pour our silicone, we need to release our mold box and our pattern. And for that, we're going to use some of the ZIP 301 mold release. And this is a non-silicone mold release, which means it does not contain any silicone oil. And that's really important because if the mold release contains silicone oil, it could actually either contaminate your silicone or cause it to bond to the pattern. So real important, make sure you're using a compatible mold release. And once you apply your mold release to your pattern and your mold box, that you give it plenty of time to dry so that it doesn't create little gas bubbles in the surface of your silicone. And now ready to mix up and pour our 5110 silicone. 5110 silicone is mixed one to one. So we're going to use 180 grams of part A to 180 grams of part B. Now I know I said earlier that that worked out to dividing that 334 grams would work out to 167 grams of A and B. But we're doing a little bit extra because you're always going to lose a little bit in the mixing and pouring process. So you always want to round up and have a little bit more silicone than you actually need just to make sure that you have enough to fill your mold box and you don't lose any in that process of mixing and pouring the silicone. Now we're also going to add a little bit of silicone pigment and this is purely optional but what this does this just helps us see our material better when we're mixing because we're mixing two colorless translucent components together by adding just a little dab of silicone pigment this lets us see when those two parts are evenly mixed and everything is thoroughly blended together. And you'll notice here I'm scraping the sides and the bottom of the mixing container really well until I get one even color of blue. So that's really about all the silicone pigment does. It just helps us get everything thoroughly mixed. And remember, always a good idea to scrape the sides and the bottom of your mixing container to get that all incorporated in that mixture. Now, 5110 has around a 30 minute working time and a three to four hour demold at room temperature. And it's important to remember that uh, warmer climates will accelerate the cure, whereas colder temperatures will slow it down. Now, once we've filled up our mold box, we're ready to sit this on a level surface for about four hours and let it fully cure. And you'll notice that I'm leaving that mixing cup right by the mold. And that allows me to have something to check without disturbing the actual mold. And it also gives me a way to grade my mixing work later on. So we can use this to both check and make sure we know when the silicone is completely cured. And also we can check when we pull this out, if everything pulls clean out of the mixing cup, that's a good sign 
find that we did a good thorough job mixing our silicones. There you see I did a bang up job of mixing the parts A and B together. Everything out came out nice and clean and beautiful. And this is also a good way to check if you have any contamination issues on your pattern, then you'll know because it's on your pattern because if everything sets up in the mixing cup good, but you have a problem in the mold, then that's a good indicator that your pattern might be contaminated. So just one of those other little details to remember when you're working with platinum silicones. Now ready to just break apart our foam core box and peel the silicone away from our pattern. Now once we've demolded our fresh silicone mold, a lot of times it'll have little bits of uh, protolina clay left over from where you attach the mold box to the baseboard. And most of that's pretty easy to clean out, but there are times when uh, sometimes the easiest, fastest way to clean out a mold is just pour a quick cast with one of the fast setting resins like TC802 or TC800. Now ready to uh, see how this works for cold cast brass. So here I'm putting some brass powder into that mold and now you can see that very soft silicone at work. And you see how that grabs a thin veneer of that metal powder and holds that on the surface. Now once we've uh, moved the metal powder around the surface of the mold and coated all the sides, we can dump the excess back into the brass powder container. And this is just a very economical way to do cold casting because we just use a very thin veneer of metal powder on the surface of our mold. And now we can mix up some pigmented TC800. This is just a small four ounce batch of TC800 with some black poly pig color mixed into it. And then we can pour it in behind the metal powder in the mold. And what happens with this process is polyurethane resin like TC800 is very adhesive. So what happens is the polyurethane resin bonds to that metallic surface or that powdered metal on the surface of the mold and then pulls it out with the resin. And then you wind up with that veneer of metal powder bonded to the surface of the resin cast. And then we can use 4 aught steel wool to shine it up. And you want to be careful, obviously use a very fine steel wool. This is uh, what I believe is the 4 aught or ultra fine steel wool to shine this up. And you want to be careful not to overdo it or you'll sand through that layer of metal powder down to the resin underneath. But once we shine that up, we can also add some uh, uh, waxes. Some of the Sculpt Nouveau metal waxes can also be used to give it a little bit more uh, age and character. And there we have our finished cold cast brass piece. So there you have the process of choosing a mold material, be it firm or soft silicone. And of course, the volume formula for calculating the cubic inch volume and calculating how many pounds or grams of silicone are needed for a given mold project. Now, for those of you curious about cylindrical formulas, I'll put a link to a previous tutorial we did on that, so be sure to check that out, as well as I'll also link to a video on cold casting, so check that out as well. And as always, all of the materials used in our tutorials are available on our website at brickintheyard.com. Thanks again for watching.